right now they're just troublemakers and rule breakers. <laughs> they get up on the counters and everything else. Like me. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah. Some people would say. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but we love them. Uh, you're really on the cat, do you? They own you. I think so. I think that's true about dogs, too. Yeah. Well, we shall get started, and when Annette joins us, Annette will join us. Linda Simmons thought she might come, but she might have forgotten again. I wanted to just start again um, with any questions. If you have, um, if something has um, jumped into your head since the last time we were together, um, Again, I just want to make sure we pay attention to what those questions are. So I want to give you a chance to um, for us to write those down. But we can always we can always write them down as to as our time goes by today if they come up. We're going to be looking specifically today at some history. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, uh, how the Episcopal Church operates. We're gonna, and we're going to look at specifics about St. Andrews today. So that doesn't mean that you can't have other, you know, thoughts and questions. It just, I, that's, that's where we're going to pay particular attention today. No problem. I did pull out a couple of books that I was trying to find last time, and I found this time. So the ones I was trying to find this time, I'm sure I will find next week. But um, this brief history of the Episcopal Church um, is a is a is is a good little book. It's not you know, not as brief as the little one I sent home with you last week, but it is good. And then the Anglican tradition. Um, so a little, those are a little older than than some. Um, and when I find unabashedly Episcopalian, I'll give it to you because it's really a good a good little book. Um, so that's that's what I have for if you are interested in taking something home and, and reading it. I'm going to talk about these two in just a little bit. So the place we're going to start today is about um, the um, 1700s. Uh, which, is, which is a pretty decent place to start. Uh, previous to about the 1700s, um, some just big pieces of history we know um, have to do with the, um, the uh, what you might call the first split, um, which happened around the 500s when East and West split. So um, there was um, a church in Rome and then the others. So the church in Rome would be the Western church and then the the, the split that happened there was an eastern, so that you would describe it as an east and west split. And um, what we know about today as the um, Orthodox Church would be that. So that was sort of the big, the first big one. So what has come from the Orthodox Church is, is what we would call eastern. And then the Western Church is what? out of Rome. Spread of the Roman Empire. Um, I had a great time when I was in um, the UK last summer and I got to see Hadrian's Wall, the northernmost point of the Roman Empire. Um, and that the wall was built between Edinburgh, about Edinburgh, and um, the western shore uh, to keep those savage Scots out. <laughs> So that represents the northernmost border of the Roman Empire at the time. Um, you know, fast speed ahead to the 17th century, um, and we have already gone by uh, Martin Luther. And Martin Luther never caused a split, uh, but the followers of Martin Luther um, split away from that sort of main chunk of the Roman church um, and began to be called something other than the Roman Catholic Church. Um, they began to be called after Martin Luther. We know them as Lutherans. 
there is at, at, when that happened, there was all sorts of splinters then. It, it's, it's almost like, like once, once the first schism happened, once that first splinter happened, then all sorts of splinters happened. And they happen for all sorts of reasons. You're either too um, uh, popish, you're either too much like Rome, or you're not enough like Rome. Um, so we have the Puritans who really were um, in that northwestern part of Europe in the um, um, the Netherlands, <laughs> that area. The Puritans were were sort of in that area, and the Puritans. Um, were very much um, believers in sort of um, simplicity and sparseness. So you can see how that would have would have gone against everything Rome was uh, with pomp and circumstance and ceremony and and, and uh, this that and the other thing. So so we so we had the Martin Luther splinter. We have the Puritan splinter. And, and so, so the Roman Empire and the Catholic Church were um, part of, of what we call to, today the UK, that, that um, island that is Britain. And the island that was Britain had its own king. So part of an understanding of kingship is that the king is appointed by God. A monarchy is, a, is appointed by God. That's, that's the way that that was understood. So you got this thing happening then, of course, because you've got a king who is, a, is you know, sort of, if not appointed by God, you know, um, anointed by God um, and you've got and you've got emperors in Rome and then you've got this church that is overall so the history then in England is really the place we focus because um, it is what f sort of formed um, who we are uh, today um, lots and lots of back and forth of, in that Place because if indeed a king is anointed by God, then how then then that king is also head of the church. That monarchy is one and the same. So now you have a monarch um, who opposes the church in Rome um, and says that this is this is going to be the way we do it here. Yes. Wasn't the Church of Rome established before the kingship of Britain? Oh yes. Yeah, I mean that goes that goes way 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 back. Yeah. But but you also but you have this this um, sort of these upstart kings in Britain that that claim that anointing by God that claim all powerful that claim that um, they are the head of the church. So um, that's in direct opposition to, to the, the, uh, the Roman Church, the Roman Catholic Church. So you have lots of, lots of back and forth in Britain, lots of fighting and beheading. I mean, all of those stories that we know are about who's the authority, who's in charge here. And, um, and the Puritans were also a piece of that. So just so just imagine that you, th that the king now is um, is Roman Catholic, so that means that everything else go has to go away, and there's and there's there's um, burning and there's um, stealing and there's you know putting away of all of the um, well, the, the, actually it would go the other way. It's when the Puritans rose up and they didn't like any of the ceremony, so, so all of the icons, all of the, um, all of the um, paintings, all of, all of that stuff was, in many, many places, was destroyed. 
um, and then a po and then a king rises up who um, who takes power and says, no, we're going to be this church here in England. And then the people who oppose that one, that king get get sort of um, you know thrown into the dungeon, thrown into the tower. Those are that's or, those are all the stories that that we know to be true. Until we get to Elizabeth the first, Elizabeth the first was an amazing mediator. She was able to um, find the middle way between the Roman church and the, and the English church. Um, and we point to Elizabeth I as the one who sort of gave rise to what we are today, which we call the via media, the middle way. There's a, there's a middle way between um, the the. Roman Church and the Protestant Church, um, and at that time, that middle way was neither was neither Roman nor Protestant, but Anglican Church Church of England. So that's that's the Elizabethan settlement, and she was really really able to um, to hold the center. And who um, help help people not and you know knock off heads and throw into dungeons and be in the tower, all of that sort of stuff. It, Elizabeth was able to do was able to do that. Um, that's not to say there wasn't unrest, um, but it is to say that we do credit her with being able to to at least. If, I mean, it's. I think it's your our first real clear understanding of our Anglican selves uh, that we don't really have to agree on it, um, but we but we will have we will have something that holds the center, that shows us what where the middle is, and and we can be anywhere in that, and be Anglican, um, and she's she was she was brilliant in being able to do that. So just to interrupt mm -hmm. So despite all the stories and the popular lore that the Anglican Church, aka the Episcopal Church, mm -hmm. came about simply because Henry VIII wanted a new wife. That's that, what I had heard. So I yeah. avoided that completely. I know, but I, I can see one of the wheels turning. So, well, yeah, well, what about Henry VIII? You know, but it, it really was more because of Henry's daughter that established something that was lasting yes yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah I mean that's that is popular lore um, and it just it, it, it just isn't where we find our I mean it isn't it isn't it, it, it was Elizabeth's brilliance to have to be able to have that to, to have a settlement that allowed for um, holding that middle that allowed that via media to emerge so then what we have, uh, is, so there, there's life in England. What we know about um, colonization of, um, of this land, of the Americas, is that um, people came for all sorts of reasons. Um, sometimes people left their home countries because there was famine and disease and there was no opportunity anymore for farming. Sometimes people left their country, and that was a huge reason many left their countries. Sometimes people left their countries because of religious persecution, because they felt like they could not uh, have free religious expression where they were. So we have, um, we have all of that as this land begins to be settled. All of that. Every single one of those people and groups of people is coming to this land with all sorts of very, very clearly held beliefs. So you have a multiplicity of um, religious beliefs. We have the Puritans and and we have, um, we have the, the Roman Catholics, and we have German Catholics, and we have Norwegian Lutherans, and we have Swedish Lutherans, and we have 
just just all of this mixed bag of people coming and settling this land. We also have the English, and it was and it was the English and the French mostly. So we have French Catholics and Anglicans mostly um, who had military might anyway in in this land. Monarchy again. So the king, so King George, who is the King of England, when a lot of the colonists were settling this land, um, were when you're ordained a priest in England, not today, but in those days, you you swore to the crown, you, you that because the monarch was the head of the church. So if you are an or, if you are ordained a priest, you you were loyal to the crown, crown. So just imagine that everything you know about your American history, you have you come up on the American Revolution, and you have revolutionists and you have loyalists, and all of the priests of that Anglican Church are loyalists. They have to be loyalists. They have sworn allegiance to that crown. So so they're in they're in this quite interesting situation um, being in this land. So uh, what we see is um, how, do you, how do you have a church in a place where um, there are no bishops? So uh, remember we talked about what the word Episcopal means and it means of the bishop. So you have this, you have this plate, you have these people come into this country who are loyal to that, to the crown. And so how do you organize? How do you live in this new land, in this new way? And, and, and so, you know, the, the way a priest is ordained is by laying on of hands of their bishop. Okay? So... No problem for loyalists, but what about what about these revolutionaries? And um, how do you how are you ordained? And how do you get a bishop when you are um, in opposition to that crown? So so the the way that that happened was that um, the the bishop in England would not do the consecrating of a bishop for the for for the for the new country for the new world but um, so I, I think Scotland is always such an interesting place the, the Scottish really didn't care much for the English then and they don't care much for them now um, so uh, um, Seabury Samuel Seabury um, an ordained priest went back to be consecrated bishop and ended up going to Scotland to be consecrated bishop. And so he came back and was the first uh, bishop in the, in the United States, Samuel Seabury. Um, and then he, of course, could consecrate other bishops. So you, you have, you have a, a, a revolutionary movement growing. Um, uh, in order to make this church sort of happen in, in these United States. So um, let's see, a couple other things about that I think that are, are interesting. You have, um, you have colleges being founded um, denominationally, Harvard College for, for the um, Puritans, Yale for the Congregationalists, um, all sorts of different uh, different training grounds for different denominations. And remember, again, there are all these denominations coming to these shores. That's really what defines us, what, what makes us who we are. Um, so we have, um, oh, let's see, what's the most important thing we have here? That in 1662, the fourth book of common prayer is approved, which is, um, which is in the Church of England. So, so that's the prayer book that comes on over uh, to the United States. You have, um, um, okay, let's go to the Declaration of Independence, um, 1776. 1784, Samuel Seabury is consecrated in, um, in 
in Scotland and then comes back here, 1785. So Declaration of Independence is signed in 1776. In 1785 is the first general convention of the Episcopal Church, 1785 the first general convention of the Episcopal Church. So the church that came from England and is called Anglican in the United States is now called, is calling itself Episcopal and not just Episcopal, but the, there's, there's a couple of names. It is, it uses Protestant the Protestant Episcopal Church is really who we are. And in the front of your prayer book, it says, guess what? This one doesn't say it. It's been dropped by wow. now. This one just says the Episcopal Church. The one just before this one says the Protestant Episcopal Church. The other name that our, our um, present presiding bishop has sort of reclaimed as a name is fondly known as DFMS, the Domestic and Foreign Missionary Society. This is our legal name. The Domestic and Foreign Missionary Society is our legal name. And our, pre our present presiding bishop um, is making, um, has been in her um, episcopacy, uh, making a very clear um, move toward mission. Mission reclaimed and renamed and reimagined. Um, in ways that are not the same as the sort of colonizing mission that the um, Church of England did in Africa and that um, happened in, in the United States as well. That's sort of the kind of colonization that, um, um, that um, takes over a culture, strips a culture, um, and um, claims a culture is less than than the than the, um, the dominant culture, so um, that 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 re sort of reimagining what who we are as the the domestic and foreign missionary society has been um, a, a real focus of of her episcopacy. So as as the Episcopal Church. Um, I mean, there are, you know, the, the, you probably know this, I mean, that it, on, on the East Coast, there are some Episcopal churches, of course, that predate um, the Declaration of Independence, that predate the Constitution, that go, you know, go way back into, let's see, um, uh, Harvard, King James, Third Book of Common Prayer, we have... Uh, It is kind of interesting that, that it survived through the Revolutionary War. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It wasn't really welcome. Mm -hmm. No, no, because they were loyalists. Yeah. 1607, the Church of England is established in the first permanent English-speaking settlement in the New World, Jamestown, Virginia. The Church of England is then also established in other mid-Atlantic and southern colonies. Uh, and that's another piece, is that that the Church of England was the established church. It was the church the government said, yes, this is what we're gonna do. So that revolution had everything to do with that too, that and, and, and give, gave rise to um, what we call the separation of church and state, um, but is what it is is disestablishment of, of religion. Government cannot say that you will indeed be this, which is what is which is what originally happened, and indeed even George Washington um, sat on the vestry of an established church. An established church receives taxes from the government, and so you can see all of that that stuff that we we've learned in our American history classes and how it, you know it, 
it bubbles and boils and all of that turmoil over establishment that 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 the people who came to this country and lived for a time then were not interested in having an established church they were interested in being able to choose for themselves what that would be and therefore we have amendments amend, an amendment that says that there shall be no established church so um, as the um, the uh, domestic and foreign missionary society uh, began to make its way in the United States it began to imagine how it might be um, how, how work might be done together and so as the United States government uh, began to take shape so did the governance of what we now call the Protestant Episcopal Church and the, and the Protestant Episcopal Church fashioned itself after the United States government. So what we see today are two houses of legislation. We have a house of deputies and a house of bishops. The deputies are all elected representatives of dioceses. And then the bishops are elected as well. We elect our bishop. So that, that is also an elected office. And um, so there are, those, there are those two houses that are what we call the general convention. That's, that's how the business of the church is done. The bishops, the house of bishops, um, nominates and elects its president. <coughs> and that person is called the presiding bishop. The House of Deputies nominates mm -hmm. and elects mm -hmm. its president, mm -hmm. and that is called Um, and the person who is elected president of the House of Defu Deputies is called president of the House of Deputies. <laughs> Not sure why we get a presiding um, in one house and a president in the other house, but the root word is the same. What's really interesting about that sort of governance is that um, is that the, the we work by legislation. We work by resolution, uh, committee work, resolutions that are brought to the floor of the House and are, um, are, are, are uh, discussed and, and people talk for and against and all sorts of interesting things and then the, and then the House votes on it. So if legislation originates in the House of um, at the House of Deputies, the House of Deputies votes on it, and then it has to go over to the House of Bishops, and the House of Bishops has to talk about it, decide what they're going to do, and vote yay or nay on that. And if they come up with an amendment, that has to come back to the House of Deputies, and you do the whole thing over again. So um, it's it's a very um, cumbersome um, way to do business. It has you know worked pretty okay fine sometimes and sometimes not. How often does it meet? The, the um, general convention meets every three years. Uh, general convention year is next year. For how long? The, the length of time for general con convention has been reduced. It, 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 it was uh, the one time general convention I think was um, like 20 days, something like that. Um, 14 days, 12 days. <laughs> this general convention coming up next year is 10 days. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of work to get done in 10 days. Um, and I'm going to tell you something new about that, but I want to I wanna make sure that if you have questions about, about this part that you ask these, those questions. I guess I always thought the presiding bishop was 
absolute top. So is there no, it's, do they always have to reconcile? It's a very, it's a very good observation. The, the presiding bishop is, it has really no authoritative power over anything. The presiding bishop is what we call the um, um, leader among equals. And, you know, and that office has, has ha gained different types of notoriety over time as, as um, issues have come up and the presiding bishop has spoken on those issues. Um, but the reality is, is that the presiding bishop has no um, sort of legislative authority over, over the House of Bishops and the um, House of Deputies, um, the president has, has no legislative. We, we, we have this sort of structure, and yet we really prefer to um, talk about it. Um, we've, we, really, we really like the thought of consensus, and yet we have a legislative um, way of doing business. So we find ourselves incredibly caught in how things happen. And the reality is, is that we are people of common prayer. <laughs> so, so um, what, what happens with us often is that change takes place in the local church. That, that's where it, it's, it, it is very much a grassroots organization. That, that things, things begin to be practiced in the, on the local level and then we and then we said, hmm, maybe since many, many, many people are doing it this way, we should change our, our um, change, uh, change the, uh, the liturgy, or we should change um, who we ordain, or we should change um, who we marry, and we might change um, um, who gets to be bishop. So often, m our history shows us that 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 sort of change has come from the roots up, not from the top down. Um, so we, we, we really have a very uh, funny and odd polity uh, because of that. We, we think we're this way, and yet we act this way. Um, so far, so good. I mean, it, it hasn't been awful. I mean, one of the, one of the huge, at least in contemporary um, times, w one, of the, um, one of the most interesting changes has been the ordination of women. And um, that happened in practical ways rather than in legislative ways. So that, that there were women who felt called to be priest and there were bishops who believed um, and trusted that call and were willing to ordain those women as priests before general convention said, that's what we're gonna do. So we have what we call this irregular ordination and we lived with that for a few years and then general convention said, okay, let's do that wasn't quite that easy but, <laughs> but that's that's the way that that change really did happen and how long ago was that 40 years now we just celebrated the 40th anniversary of the ordination of women in the Episcopal Church sometimes you'd never know that and I think another really revealing story about general convention is that general convention met in the midst of the Civil War yes and they went ahead and held general convention. By both sides. But the, the bishops from the southern states did not come. But the bishops that were there from the north never counted them as absent. Yeah. If there was a vote, they were marked as abstaining. And they honored their presence even though they weren't there. And I read that we were, the Episcopal Church was really the only denomination to survive the Civil War without a split. That's why we have Southern Baptists and Southern Methodists. Mm -hmm. and, but, and part of that was because of that cohesiveness of general convention in honoring their, their Southern counterparts that mm -hmm. didn't come. 
They didn't reject them out of hand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that says an awful lot mm -hmm. about yeah. that yeah, middle yeah, way, yeah, that yeah, idea yeah, of yeah. Mm -hmm. community. Yeah. Uh, 1861 so, to 1867, during the American Civil War, Southern Episcopal Diocese joined the Protestant Episcopal Church of the Confederate States, but are welcomed back after the war ends. So it, there was no... There was no split. Where did the crest come from? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. Because it's <laughs> at, always at all. looked like a shield. Yeah, it, it does look like a shield with the cross in the center and then that little, little banner of of uh, little crosses in the. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I just read something on that one. No, well, maybe, you can, maybe you can and come the up with that. Mean yeah, the colors mean. Blue is purity and, and white is. Well, white is purity. purity. And blue is. Red is blood. Marty's going to tell us here in a second because I don't know the answer to that one. So, like, when, I mean, there was a big movement, missionary society, you know, just as much as the Catholic Church was across, you know, the, the New World, the states mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, but we see, like, you know, basilicas in honor of the Catholic Church. Yeah. yeah, I think what show um, I, there's there's what is most evident is that the uh, Church of England, um, because the British colonized, uh, they colonized Africa. They call you know they colonized the colonies, um, and um, those early missionaries. Um, we're very clear that you need to do it our way. Our way is the right way and that you need to do it this particular way. You need to believe in God this particular way. You need to do your ceremony this particular way. And, and so you'll, you'll, the, the, the Anglican Church in Africa is very much a, as a result of a colonization. Um, and, you know, be that as we, you know, good or bad today, what, how, however we want it to judge, there, Africa's got a huge, a huge Anglican church um, because of that. Um, I don't, I don't know anything about architecture in, I've never, I've never been there, um, but you do have huge um, Anglican, Church of England cathedrals in the UK. Um, in the United States, there are a few of those things. There's the, there's the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., um, and there and there are other um, other kinds of structures similarly to that, but we don't we don't we don't see the 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 scope of cathedral um, in the United States as as uh, in the Catholic Church. Just don't see that. Mostly, I think because. I don't know. I don't know. I think it's because of the missionary understanding. You, know, you, you, you come west, and you're not building big, huge, big, huge structures like that. Do you know something? Um, it was the shield was adopted by General Convention in 1940. The red cross on a white field is the Saint George Cross, and it's an indicator of our link to the Church of England, the Mother Church of the Anglican Communion. The miniature cross is in the blue quadrant symbolize the nine original dioceses that met in Philadelphia in 1789 to adopt the Constitution of the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States. Connecticut, blah, 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 blah. Um, the blue field in the upper left is a color traditionally associated with the Blessed Virgin Mary and it's symbolic of Jesus' human nature, which he received from his mother. The outline of the miniature crosses is in the form of the St. Andrew's Cross, which is in tribute to the Scottish Scottish Church's role in ordaining the first American bishop, Samuel Seabury. The colors red, white, and blue symbolize respectfully red, the sacrifice of Christ and Christian martyrs, white, the purity of Christian faith, and blue, the humility of Christ received from the Virgin Mary. In duplicating the colors of the American flag, they also represent the Episcopal Church's standing in the United States branch of the Anglican Communion. There you go. I, I didn't know that, actually. I remembered reading something about it when I had it done on my toenail. <laughs> 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 
Oh, there you go. There so I you had go. to hold the phone down there while she died. What does this mean? There you go. So it wasn't just scribbling. So the word that we use to describe the governance is this word, polity. And um, I, I, I did speak a little bit of that with the two houses and the presiding bishop and the, um, the president of the House of Deputies. There's another, bran another branch, that's the executive branch. <laughs> it's not the executive branch, it's the executive council. And the executive council, are that's all elected, and the executive council meets between conventions, general conventions. So if there's work to be done, the executive council takes that work on between conventions. Um, so moving forward now, um, the last general convention, 2012, was our last general convention held in Indianapolis. There was a lot, a lot, a lot of conversation about how, how Episcopalians do their work in the world and is this sort of polity the best way for Christ's mission to be accomplished in the world? And there are many, many, many people whose answer to that question is no, that there, there's got to be a different way. This polity is very cumbersome. Um, in order to affect change, it takes, um, it takes loads and loads and loads of time and, and conversation. And conversation isn't a bad thing. But one of the things our presiding bishop has always talked about is how can we be nimble? How, how can we